things just didn't work out for me to get up here, and uh, I was uh, blessed with Papa's message on on what he had uh, been speaking. Oh, wrong notes. Let's see here. Uh, revival. This morning, I want to continue the subject of revival, and uh, let's see, find my notes here. I can talk about it. I'll start off with something funny. Brother Dennis loves my funnies, and I heard this story of this atheist that was on this ship in the middle of the ocean, and a storm comes up and starts rocking the boat and tossing the boat to and fro, and as if that wasn't bad enough, all of a sudden, a Loch Ness monster comes out of the ocean grabs the boat, picks it up, and starts shaking the atheist in his boat. All of a sudden, the atheist screams out, Dear God! And God just stops time, freezes time, and says, Wait a minute, I thought you didn't believe in me. He said, Lord, give me a break. I didn't believe in the Loch Ness Monster five minutes ago either. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. Only Dennis got that one, I guess. But anyway, <laughs> let me tell you, sometimes some circumstances will change your belief system. Amen. And I believe that uh, revival is one of those things that circumstances can create your desire to want a revival. And I don't know about you, but we're living in a, in a world of uncertainty right now. We don't know if World War III is about to break out. We don't know what's going on. And I don't know about you, but it has driven me to make sure that I'm in right tune with God, that I may be able to hear His voice, know which move to make, whether to go left or to go right. I want to make sure I do not miss a beat during this time of uncertainty. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so I want to speak a little bit more about some revival. You know, Papa, uh, revival, number one, is one of the most exciting words in the Christian vocabulary. I think when we when we hear about revival, we get excited. In the old days, when we pictured revival, we pictured old-timey tent meetings with sawdust on the ground and, and uh, women's hair pins slinging out and, and having a good old time. It seemed like it never ended. I remember when I was a kid, I think it was Ruth Garinger that had the six-week revival at our old church and several other people that, that just impacted our little tiny community uh, with an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and, and, and lives begin to change. And one of the guys, I think it was Moon Man Mullins, I think, had gave his life to God and just created an explosion because Moon Man was one of those guys that everybody knew was not right with God. And he was a rough cat. And, uh, but when he decided to change his life, people began to perk up and say, you know, that's got to be God. There's no way. That God just changed on his own. Amen. And, uh, and so I hope that when you look at my life, you also will say like Moon Man, there is no way that dude would have made it without God. I tease often that my daddy, me, my brother, my, my whole family just about, if God wouldn't have called us, we'd have been heading straight for the pits of hell, wide open, a little bit faster than most probably, uh, because we have... Uh, we have been in some wrong places, amen. But revival is exciting. It literally means to revive and to make alive again. Uh, I believe the entire message of the gospel is based on a heart revival, a change, a renewing, a, a bringing back from death to life, uh, a heart revival. I believe that revival is coming back to the things of God and waking up to the knowledge of His presence everywhere. He's everywhere. So many times we say we don't see God. I believe it's you don't see him because you didn't look around. God is there. You're just missing him. Amen. Uh -uh. But, uh, you know, when we think about uh, the Wesley brothers and Billy Graham and Catherine Booth and people who preach simple yet very powerful messages, I, I believe there's a scripture that talks about he, he preached a simple message so that the Holy Spirit could be used so that you didn't get confused by thinking it was human wisdom. And I believe those same people preached those simple yet powerful messages uh, with a great sense of expectation that the Holy Spirit was going to do something. Amen. And I believe because of that expectation, the Holy Spirit did indeed move. Amen. But these, the impact of these revivals was great. There's, there's stories of beer joints and clubs shutting down and even courthouses that, ha that just closed their doors because there was no cases to be heard during those revivals 
that took place because there was some revived hearts that was happening, some changes that was happening in, in the society that basically fixed the problem. You know, I love to say uh, when I'm in some kind of a compromised situation that, you know, maybe somebody thinks, oh, you're up to no good. I say, look, you don't have nothing to worry about with me because I fear hell more than I fear jail. And if you can fear hell more than you fear jail, police ain't got nothing to worry about. Amen. And, uh, and so I believe that living at that next standard that the school teacher doesn't have anything to worry about. Mom and dad doesn't have to worry about it. That the police officers don't have to worry about us if we will understand where we're supposed to be and understand that there's something bigger than jail. Amen. <clears throat> it's exciting to think about what the, the revival of revived hearts can do to our world that we live in. I don't know about you, but I see a world that needs some change. I see a world that needs God. I see a world that is ready even for God. At least for me, I'm ready for some changes to take, uh, take place. Amen. I believe that that, that expectation uh, will make it happen. I, I believe that uh, God is moving even when we can't see him, as the song says. Even when we can't feel him, as the song says. God is still on the throne, even in this war going on with Russia and Ukraine and all of China and Taiwan and all the other junk. I believe God is still on the throne and he's getting ready for a move of God to take place. Amen. I believe we need to get excited. I believe we need to be prepared. I believe we need to get our heart ready. Uh, I believe that, that we need to prepare ourselves uh, for, the, for the revival that's taking place. Amen. Number one I want to talk about is that God is who brings the revival. It's not us. However, it is through us that he brings it. I believe he revives our hearts, and in turn, it revives churches, it revives schools, it revives workplaces, it revives communities and, and society as a whole. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and you may ask your, uh, say to yourself, Caleb, I don't know if I'm ready for revival. Well, let me tell you, ready or not, here I come. It's here. Amen. When we read in Isaiah 43, 16, it says, I'm the Lord. I was backing up. We worry about a way. Uh, uh, my father going to Africa, we worry about his protection. We worry about the war happening in Nigeria or maybe they hijacked his plane or whatever. Or, or, or maybe we just wonder if we're going to even be able to go. But when I read in Isaiah 43, it says that God is God. I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry, play, a dry path through the sea. I called, for, I called forth the mighty army of Egypt with all its chariots and horses. I drew them beneath the waves and they drowned. You see, God can take care of our enemies. Amen. He snuffed, out, snuffed them out like a smoldering candle wick. But forget all of that. It's nothing compared to what God's about to do. It says, for I am about to do something new. See, I have already begun it. I believe that God will make a pathway through the wilderness. When you think that you need to, to do whatever to be in protection or you got to do whatever to have preparation, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not really one of those preppers, but I guess I kind of started buying some beans and rice and a few extra bullets. Uh, but I can tell you that all of that stuff that I rely on, I ain't got to worry about as long as I got God on the side, on my side, amen, because he can create a pathway in the wilderness. He can create rivers in the dry wasteland, amen. Papa shared last week about some requirements for revival. He talked about one was humbleness and two was hungry and three was holiness. Well, I want to continue on in that. In the heart of every passionate Christian should be a hunger. It should be a longing for a personal revival, amen. We should be ready for one. A, a, a true desire to connect with God should be in our, in our hearts. We should be looking to uncover the Holy Spirit and what He can do for us, amen. Unfortunately, sometimes the challenge is, is that we are tossed between what we want to do, our body, uh, compared to what the Holy Spirit wants to do, our sp uh, uh, what God wants to do, which is our spirit. And we beat ourselves up sometimes for falling short of that spiritual desire. But we got to remember that all have sinned and fell short. But that God is the one who brings the revival. It's not us. 
It's through us that he brings it. You see, so many times I feel like, man, I got to get over there and change that guy. I got I to gotta fix him. I got to gotta hip him. But let me tell you, we get frustrated when you think you're the one who's supposed to do that. Amen. We're simply to plant some seeds and to trust God. Amen. And to revive our own heart. Quit worrying about trying to fix somebody else till you get yourself revived a little bit because I believe that spirits are contagious. If you'll get it right, the ones hanging around you, you're going to rub off on. Amen? I believe you're con a conduit of revival. Uh, I believe the revival starts with you, and I believe that you can hurry it up or you can slow it down. Uh, it's all about what you choose to do. Amen? But I believe for revival to happen in you, it requires two things. Number one, as Papa said, a humbleness, but a repentant heart and a hungry spirit. I believe if you get hungry, you'll get holy. Er, I put an E-R on the end. You, but I believe that God, if you'll get hungry, God will fill your, your hunger. It says so. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. For revival to happen through, oh, I just said what will happen, what's the requirement for revival to happen in you? Now I want to give you some requirements for, for revival to happen through you. Number one, it requires you to lead yourself. You know, some of the fruits of the Spirit include self-discipline, self-control. I believe it's up to us to lead ourselves to have a little discipline in our lives so that God can take, take that and use it. Amen. We've got to take some personal responsibility. We've got to make a decision to carry it wherever you go. I heard this story about five frogs sitting on a log and four of them decided to jump off. How many frogs are still sitting there? All five, four of them just decided. They didn't actually jump. <laughs> Amen. You've got to make a decision to carry it wherever you go. Amen. Amen. Don't just decide, but to do it. Amen. Amen. I believe you need to lead with your, with your personally, uh, with your person, yourself. You've got to lead a little bit personally. Number one, I believe you need, I could camp out on some of these. I got 14 ways if you're taking notes. It started off with 10 and I added four and that's just part of the message. But anyway, so y'all just hang in there. Number one, I believe you need to rediscover a fresh reliance and dependence on the Holy Spirit. We got to be reliable, uh, reliant, dependent on Him. You see, it's dangerous for me at least to have some, some money in the bank sometimes because all of a sudden I'm not so reliant on praying God to fulfill a need that I have to pay a bill. Yeah. You know, there's a scripture that says, Lord, don't make me so rich that I don't need to call on you, but don't make me so poor I got to go steal. There's a fine line of being dependent and relied and understand that he is the source of everything and be careful thinking that you and your job is what created that source. It's not. God created you to have the skill, the energy, the talent, the help, and the opportunity. It all came from God. Every bit of it, nothing has to do with you. People say, Caleb, I'm so proud of you. Well, look, Caleb's just living the life that God put together. Caleb's just living the life of blessings that God provided. Amen. Nothing much special about Caleb except he figured out who to trust and who to rely on. Amen. Number two, I believe we should tell others about our own personal God experiences and expectations. I love to talk about that you could take every scripture away from me. You could, t you could make me somehow forget everything that I learned growing up as a preacher's child. And I, let me tell you, I remember more scriptures probably just by hearing it than, than I cannot tell you where to find it in the Bible. But I've heard it so many times from an early child up to an adult that it is stuck inside of here. And, and those expectations and experiences of the Bible is one thing, but when I start thinking about Caleb's own personal Bible stories, I don't have to think about Jonah in the well. I don't have to think about Peter walking on the water. I can think about Caleb being addicted to crack rock, and God delivered me when they said it wasn't, in, what, it wasn't possible. I, th I can think about God bringing me from facing bankruptcy to now having money in the bank, and, and most recently I paid cash for 50 acres of property. Now let me tell you, crackheads don't do that. Amen. Me and Butch was down in Panama City, and, and we flew down. I was able to fly down to the beach to Destin to eat some sushi. Me and Butch was talking, crackheads don't do that. Amen. Amen. This is the life that God changed in me. Amen. And, and it's, it's from reliant on God. Amen. Number three, 
<clears throat> refuse to allow familiarity and longevity to rob you of a fresh season of God. You see, so many times, I'll say it again, refuse to allow familiarity and, and longevity to rob you of a fresh season of God. You see, we are sometimes walking in a fresh season of God, but, but for some reason we've lost that ah. We've lost that thank you, Papa, mentality. Well, let me tell you, I've said it before. I believe your thankfulness is, creates a magnet for God to do something in your life. Amen? You've got to get rid of this peppermint. We've got to... We got to not let that familiarity, not let just having blessing after blessing make you just not be so thankful anymore. I'm kind of a spoiled brat, really, when it comes to me and God, because there's not many prayers that I've prayed that God has not answered. I mean, He gives me everything I want, desire, and things I can't even think I want or desire, He gives to me. He spoils me rotten, but I got to be careful, make sure I include that thank you. You know, when I'm talking on the phone, a lot of times to my boss, and this week he, shared, he gave me three different extra jobs this week, and when I hung up the phone, I, I, I'm quick to, to cram in as many thank yous as I can during that two-minute conversation. Matter of fact, at the end, I don't just say thank you. I say thank you, thank you, thank you, three times at least, because I understand that your gratitude creates that magnet of attraction for God to want to bless you. Amen. Don't get so used to it. That it, re, that it robs, you, robs you of the fresh season of blessing, amen, that fresh season of God. Number four, <clears throat> remind yourself of answered prayers and, and miraculous provision in the past. Another one I love to say is based on my past, my future is going to be okay because God has took care of me this far. Why would he stop now? The other scripture I love to rely on, especially when I'm messing up, is that the work that he has started in you, he will be faithful to complete. It's not my work, it's his work. If he started it, he's probably going to finish it. I need to quit worried about it, amen? That's what scripture said. Numbers, let's see here, number five, reestablish good attitudes. So many times, boy, we get some raunchy attitudes. I believe your attitude can mess you up, Amen. We need to reestablish good attitudes and godly mindsets. How do, you, how do you establish a godly mindset? It's what you feed your mind is what you establish your mindset to be. If you're watching cussing and carrying on kind of a movies, guess what you'll be doing tomorrow? Your mindset will be having some cussing and carrying on going on. If you don't ever put it in your mind, then you don't have that mindset. Amen. So, so watch that uh, mindset, amen, reestablish those good attitudes, reestablish having that thankfulness, reestablish saying thank you, thank you, thank you, create that new godly mindset. Number six, reprior, uh, reprioritize some spiritual disciplines. You know, I, I uh, uh, me and Jeannie went down to Mike Murdoch's and, and a couple of places, and there was a prophet down there named Joshua Holmes, and and uh, anyway, he started reading our names, literally called us out, Caleb and, and Jenny. And around here, it's, it's kind of, you know, we get prophecies here and there. But who knows if the preacher's already talked to daddy and knows all my life. So when they tell me something about me that's uh, surprising, sometimes I discount it a little bit because I think that guy may already know me. But when we went to Texas, there was no way knew, nobody knew us. I mean, nobody knew I was Papa's son. Nobody knew my name was Caleb Good, and they didn't even know if I was saved or not. But this dude started calling me and Jeannie out by our names. And, man, it gave us a fresh, uh, a fresh mindset. Uh, <clears throat> but it was exciting because we knew that God had called us name. I lost my little spot here. Uh, but, those, oh, what I was going to say is, is he called me out and said, Caleb, I see you as a guy that that gets out and prays every morning at a certain time of the day. And at that, my, at that time of my life, I did. I had a routine. When I'd wake up, I'd go get on the bicycle, and me and the hooky dog would ride around the campground. And, and I prayed for about, I don't know, much time as I had uh, allowance of, but about 30 minutes or so. But it was almost a consistence. But I didn't tell anybody that's what I was doing. But this guy read me by the book. But it was a spiritual uh, discipline routine that I had, I, that I have gotten away from. I still pray, don't get me wrong, but it was not that regular routine daily. 
But let me tell you something. As I was creating this message, that was one of the things that God said is that we should reprioritize our spiritual disciplines because those were some things that, that really pulled me closer to God to have that set time. I believe all of us needs that set time. Number seven, I believe we need to reignite some godly desires. You know, I believe that God gives us the desires of our heart, and, and a lot of times that means, well, he gave me that new car, or he gave me that beautiful wife, or whatever that desire was. But I believe as I go on here, I'll share more. God actually will give you what it is you should desire. Not just that physical thing, but he'll give you what it is you should crave to have more of. And I believe that that is reigniting some godly desires. Number eight, restore the joy of his salvation. We were talking just yesterday about some people that, uh, well, it was my wife's mother who looked younger. She's the oldest, but she looks the youngest out of her siblings. We started talking about that the joy of the Lord is her strength, that a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. I believe it'll actually keep you young looking if you'll get some joy in your life. Amen. But restore the joy of his salvation. Number nine, recommit to a life of extravagant generosity. Another thing that I wanted to share about was Dave Ramsey. I <clears throat> just wrote a new book. And, but one of the things is about how to be a millionaire. But uh, one of the things is, is that his, he talks about having extravagant generosity. Extravagant generosity. Basically, that the giving that you adopt as a, as a successful person, first of all, it's a requirement, if you want to be successful almost, that you become a giving person. It's the principle of seed harvest. But that extravagant generosity, if you really look at successful folks, most of the time they're the people who are attractive, number one, very beautiful. But they're usually servants. They'll usually be the guy that opens up the door for you. They'll be the guy that picks up the trash after the banquet, after the party. They'll be the guy that is serving because they understand that's how they got blessed in the first place. Did you know that Jesus came and washed his disciples' feet? That's the most, it was the most, uh, the best picture of servanthood that you could draw in the Bible because them boys didn't wear any shoes. Washing their feet was, that was pretty uh, humbling, amen? But I believe that, uh, that we should commit to that life of extravagant generosity. Number 10, reset your heart for the loss. You know, as my Aunt Sandra died uh, yes, a couple of days ago, I started thinking about, you know, my Aunt Sandra that I know of wasn't in church. I don't know that her husband was in church. I don't know. I, I hope they believed in God and had their hearts lined up with God, but that's my own family I've not got concerned with. You see, I believe that we got to reset our hearts for the lost, especially our families. And we got to understand that that, man, if, it, if, if it's to be, it's up to me should be our mentality. That if Aunt Sander was supposed to receive Christ, maybe I was supposed to be the one that went over there and made sure it happened. But I've been so busy and caught up in what I've done, I have not even visited my Aunt Sandra in, I don't know, maybe a year or more. Uh, and really, I didn't go visit her. It was just at a family gathering probably that I even seen her. But I had to ask myself, so, uh, Caleb, you got to reset your heart for the loss in order for the revival to take place in me. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, here's number 11. This is the, the fun one, 11, 12, 13, and 14. This is when God started adding to me because uh, I had so much to say, but he gave me some more. Number 11, don't let Satan tell you lies about you being disqualified. Boy, I tell you what, even Papa's message the other day makes you wonder sometimes just how saved you are. I tease about Brother Rusty getting in that cold baptism, baptizing water up there and say, man, you got to really be saved if you get in that cold stuff. And I don't know that I'm that saved yet. But truth is, is there's a lot of days when the enemy will come to Caleb Gooden and say, Caleb, are you really saved? You ain't gave up that habit yet. You ain't changed that mindset yet. You hadn't got concerned about that lost one yet. You know, are you really saved? Or you, don't, you don't do things good enough. You don't qualify. You don't qualify to get up there and speak to those folks. You know what? I have to give up on that and say, you know, I'm not the... First of all, God didn't call the qualified. He qualified the called. And Satan is not the qualifier. 
So if he's telling you you're not qualified, discount what he said. He's not the, he's not the umpire of this game, amen? God is the qualifier, amen? And he is who is qualified anyway. It's not you. Matter of fact, no one was qualified except Christ Jesus. That's why it says, all have sinned, all have fell short of the glory of God. It's only but by Jesus. There was no pure lamb to be sacrificed except Jesus. That's why he had to do the job, amen? Amen. So be careful. <clears throat> Matter of fact, uh, Perry Stone was talking about the, his title I listened to the other day was The Tail of the Dragon. And he, and he kind of changed it up from the tail, T-A-L-E, uh, T-A-I-L to T-A-L-E. The tail of the dragon, and, and what he was sharing was that how the enemy will come in and tell you that you're disqualified. And unfortunately, a lot of times us as, as Christians jump on that same wagon to help the old enemy tell the tale that others ain't qualified. And, and, and Papa, I'm going to say something that you said the other day. You said that you didn't think that if you went out and smoked a pound of pot or drunk a bunch of booze that you was really saved. Let me tell you something. I have those same thoughts, but it ain't up to me and you. It's up to God. And let me tell you something. If you're still battling with smoking pot, drinking beer, doing crack, doing meth, eating too much, gossiping, it don't matter what your sin is, and you probably got some, because I believe if you think you got rid of all your sins, the next one you better look out for is pride, because you're going to think you're too good, and you're going to participate in telling others that I don't know that you're saved because you're still cussing in the church office over there. I don't know that you're saved because you're still doing whatever it is you're doing. Let me tell you something. God is still working on you. He's still working on me. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars. How loving and, and kindness and patient he must be because he's still working on this old cat. And let me tell you, be careful by saying that others may not be qualified because you're participating in the tale of the dragon. Amen. And it's a tale that you don't need to believe because you are not the guy that qualified. Matter of fact, one of the most powerful guys in the Bible, the Apostle Paul, a murderer of Christians, evidently still had one thing that was bothering him that he couldn't get rid of. He called it the thorn in his side, and he prayed that Jesus would remove it. But you know what God said to him? My grace is sufficient for you. You see, even with that thing that you got, that thorn in your side, that pound of pot or that gallon of booze or whatever it is you got, that thorn in your side, don't let it make you think you're not saved and qualified to go to heaven because it ain't got nothing to do with you. You are not a perfect lamb to be sacrificed by any means, but Christ Jesus is. Christ Jesus is a perfect sacrifice, and he did take the place of us that still don't have it together and, and made an allowance for us who still don't have it together. Amen. So never let what you think is your thorn in your side keep you from doing what God called you to do. You see, I think this is something bigger. When we start thinking about those thorns in our side and those things that hold us back, it's not a real problem. Until you allow it to stop what God has called you to do. Until you allow that thing that the enemy said, Hey, Caleb, you don't have it right yet. You don't need to get on that pulpit. If I listen to him and I don't get on the pulpit, then that thorn in my side is really a problem, and God's grace is not good enough anymore. But, and matter of fact, his blood on the cross is not good enough anymore, is what you're saying, is that this one thing in me is not covered by the blood. It's just too bad. God couldn't cover it by the blood. Well, let me tell you, he did, and he has took care of all of your past present and future shortcomings. Amen. So don't let that thorn in your side separate you from what God has called you to do, the fulfilling that is on your life. God's grace is sufficient. Don't participate. Number 12, 13, don't participate. I already said that in saying that others are disqualified because be careful of your opinions. Let me tell you why I say be careful of your opinions because there are some preachers, me included most of all, that have some sin and have some shortcomings. And we say some things that are wrong. We say some things that are offensive. And sometimes us as parents go home and, and we pick apart that, that preacher that maybe had some, whatever the problem was, that thorn in his side. Maybe he did say something that was offensive. Maybe he didn't live that life that was just quite right. And as we went home as parents and our little kids are sitting there and we're talking about the preacher, you know, he shouldn't have said that. 
He shouldn't have done that. You know, that guy's got a problem. He really needs to straighten up before he gets on that pulpit. Guess what may happen if we're not careful? The kids, our kids, our children that listen to that, us saying about the preacher, one day they may be in a tent revival meeting somewhere, and that preacher that you were talking about that had that thorn in his side may have been called by God to win your child to, to Christ, to, to lead the salvation of God in that child's life. But they've heard mom and daddy say, you know what, that preacher had a thorn in his side. That preacher was offensive, and that preacher ain't got it all together. Well, guess what little baby's sitting there thinking about why that preacher that God had called to, to lead your child to Christ is thinking, you know, Mom and Daddy said that guy wasn't all right. I really want to go down there and give my life to God, but under that preacher, I don't think I should. Daddy said he wasn't all right. Daddy said he had a thorn in his side. Be careful how you think your opinion is of the person that's up here because let me tell you, you might just be putting a roadblock from your child being able to be one and be able to be helped by that person you've been talking about. Amen. Be careful trying to qualify or disqualify others. You ain't the qualifier. Even the enemy's not the qualifier. God is the qualifier. Be careful what you say about the preacher. That preacher may be the one that God ordained to lead your child to Christ. And you've been sitting there beating him up at home around the dinner table. You've, you've took away his ability to win your child to Christ. Amen? Amen? Amen. Don't participate in that. Number 14, don't be guilty of talking about other people's sins and act like you don't have any of your own. Scripture says that we are a big, when we get to ready to pull the splinter out of our neighbor's eye, make sure we get the big old telephone pole that's in our own out first. Because that's always just about the way it is. Amen. And let me tell you something else. In Luke 5, 31, the Pharisees was, was kind of giving Jesus a hard time about him eating with, I think it was Levi who eventually got his name changed to Matthew. Is that right? It was sitting around a dinner table and tax collectors basically and the Pharisees said, man, why do you eat and why do you drink with those folks? And Jesus said this in, in, in Luke 5, 31 through 32. Jesus answered them and said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. And I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. If we're all real with ourselves, we know that there is some stuff in our lives that we need to admit and repent. Amen. And quit thinking that we are Mr. Goody Goody Tissues. Amen. I'm going to run real quick. I'm already out of time. But revival will create some godly desires in you. You've already said that. And it's not it will create the desires, not necessarily give you the desires, which I believe you will. But I believe you'll create the things that we want. He'll create. Uh, us to want to give. He'll create us to want to be generous. Amen. <clears throat> Scripture says that he'll give us the desires of our heart and it'll create change. Change. Some people will love it. Some people hate it. My papa loves change. He, he'll change the house around 10 times a week if mama wouldn't kill him. But uh, he loves change. Some people hate it. Uh, but let me tell you, right, revival will bring radical change. And it's a change you'll love. Amen. When God brings revival to your life, he'll stir up some things. Amen. I'm going to skip through a bunch of this here. <clears throat> when God brings revival to your life, he, he'll, you'll suddenly find yourself preoccupied with the things of God. Uh, if Kaylee was here, I was going to tell her that she'd suddenly quit obs obsessing about the hot guy in the university class and she'd suddenly become uh she'd suddenly be become obsessed about the entire salvation of the university amen and uh when when god changes your life instead of scrolling through your your instagram and your facebook you'll start scrolling through your word amen <clears throat> i believe that revival will shine a, a fresh light on your basics of your faith i believe that prayer becomes a passion Worship becomes a necessity. Reading your Bible becomes a non-negotiable. <clears throat> I don't believe uh, you, you will desire to give more than you desire to receive. I love Brother Rusty's little saying that we give to get, to give, to get, to give, to get, to give. It really is. We change our mind about why it is we want to get. And it really is because we want to give. 
Amen. <clears throat> you realize that no matter how much or little that you have, that God is in control. And he can decide to change things at any time. I don't care if you're wealthy and thinking about building more storage houses outside. God can change that in a minute. And you better figure out how to be happy in your broken day as much as you are on your whole day. Amen. Amen. God blesses those who are poor and realize they need him. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the earth. Matthew 5, 1 through 12. Just a great scripture. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. Amen. I'm going to skip through that one. Let's see. Uh, there's freedom in revival. You know, so many times we get caught up in the rat race and, and looking at that Instagram and can't stop. I don't know about you if you've ever started looking at one thing on Facebook and then before you know it, it's 30 minutes later and you just lost your time. Uh I believe there's a freedom because you'll not be caught up in some of that. I believe you'll be able to put your phone down and engage in communication with the folks around you. We went riding four-wheelers yesterday, and Chance was on his phone every time we stopped. I said, boy, put that phone up. We live in life. But anyway, uh, I love to give him a hard time about being on the phone. I believe the enemy will use your phone to distract you from what's going around on around you. Amen. There's a rat race, amen. Uh, but we are, our society, we, I got to be careful saying them. I got to make sure I change my tune and say we need God. We need a change. We need some hope, amen. Amen. And that freedom has a sound. It's attractive. People are drawn to you by the way you live. They're in, intrigued by the way you speak when revival takes place in you. Everything about you shouts freedom. Your ability to have hope in tough times shouts freedom. Your, your, the way that you handle stress without swearing shouts freedom. Your continued generosity shouts freedom. Your ability to give, I always say this, your wisdom note, your ability to give is proof that you've overcame greed. That's freedom. Amen. Your desire to care when no one else does shouts freedom. What an opportunity to bring change to those in the world by sharing Jesus and the freedom that he brings. Amen. I uh, see here. Uh, you know, I'll close it up with this one. Uh, revival. Uh, you know, oh, I'll back up a little bit. Second Corinthians chapter 3, 7 through 18. I'll just kind of go with it. But it talks about the old law and how the, the old way was with laws etched in stone led to death Though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not even look at, at Moses' face. He had to put a veil over his face when he came down because the glory shone so great on him that he had to put a veil on. And, the, and that, that new law was, was gloriful. But, but Christ said in, in this same scripture that the new, the, the, the new law, which was the new covenant, was even more gloriful. Amen. The, the new law which said that Jesus was that sacrifice for us. That he did what we couldn't do. Amen. Amen. Let's see here. I think that's about it. Closing. I'll just skip on to this. Revival will take you to the streets. Personal encounters with Jesus have radically changed the direction and the folks of people's lives for generations. We talked about Paul and how he murdered Christians. But after that encounter with Jesus, he became one of the world's greatest evangelists. An encounter with Jesus has inspired others to stand up against in iniquity, uh, inequality. Uh, it's given people a fresh passion. Uh, it has ignited global movements and radically changed local communities. Encounter with Jesus. If you've not had an encounter with Jesus, I encourage you to try it out. Because one encounter with Jesus can change everything about you. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Revival changes you and the way you live. Suddenly, a Sunday faith will not be enough. Your desire for a Monday through Saturday faith will also exist. Amen. Let's see here. Oh, man, I had so much to say. Uh, 
Our world does. I'll, I'm closing for real, Papa. Our world doesn't. Y'all can play the music. Our world doesn't need a new definition for Christianity. What we need is a new declaration of Christianity. Amen. A declaration from the revival uh, from a revival generation who live with bold faith because they know who they are in Christ. They know they are free because God sent His only Son to die for our sins. He gave us that freedom. He can we can have boldness if we understand who we are. You know, there's a generation full of hope for the future who are on a mission to declare the good news of Jesus. And you can be part of that generation. You can stand bold. You can stand courageous. You can stand victorious. You can know that God is with you. And He has your back. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> are you hungry for Christ? To do a new, to, to, to do a fresh work in you. And you may be like me. So many times, you know, we ask God to forgive us, forgive us, forgive us. We feel like we can't ask again. Lord, we've done ask you too many times. We'll keep messing up. Here we are again. I might as well quit asking. No, don't let oh enemy. Don't believe that tale of the dragon. Amen. That's just the tale of the dragon. You cannot mess up so much. There, there is not height nor depth. There is nothing that can separate you from the love of Christ in Romans chapter 8. Amen. You just got to be ready for some, for some revival to take place inside of you. Amen. Why not take a moment right now and let's pray and invite God to stir up within you a, a, a new heart, a fresh and a new, a fresh way, a new way. Understand and get back to the basics of your faith, knowing that God loves you while you are yet in sin. He's not waiting on you to qualify. He's done done the deal. He's done sent Jesus in your place. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, the, the people here today, Lord, I ask that they would receive this word. Father, thank you that, that you gave this word to me. Father, thank you, Lord, that that you are the qualifier. No matter what Caleb Gooden does, good or bad, it didn't matter. Lord, your goodness is what paved the way. Father, today if we're in here and we, we have not asked you for a fresh revival, Lord, I ask that we would ask you, Father, right now and, and even this week, Lord, tap into your presence. Father, there's freedom in the presence of you. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are here. Lord, you, you are willing and able. Father, you're still on that throne. Lord, you're still in control. We love you and we thank you for loving us where we are, but not leaving us where we are. Changing us, Lord, continually. Lord, the work that you started, you'll be faithful to complete, and we appreciate it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, come on, Papa. Praise the Lord. That's very good. Amen and amen. That's excellent. Hallelujah. I've got something. Um, Brother Dillon, would you come and hand these out to everybody? Uh, just give me about two minutes and then we'll be out of here. <clears throat> what I want to do is I want you to take one of these cards, put your name on it, and uh, your, your personal information, but also write down people that you want to see come to the Lord. People that's near you, nearby. Don't don't write somebody, I mean, you can, over in California somewhere. But I like to see them walk in these doors here and you see the people that you're praying for come to the Lord. You've got somebody in California, go ahead and pray for them. But I like for you to start thinking about people that you come in contact with every day. And that, as Caleb said, they may or may not know the Lord. Based upon their testimony to you, they have never testified that they've accepted Christ. So write down some people that you feel like good people, but they just need to know the Lord. I want to be able to pray for them, and i like to see a return. Amen. Praise God. Sister Dylan, did we ever come up with a date on Ruth?